Okay, cool. So um, let's get started. So welcome to the special year seminar on theoretical machine learning at the Institute for Advanced Study. Today, we are delighted to have one of the world's top computational epidemiologists, Professor Ronnie Rosenfeld, as our speaker. Ronnie is a professor at Carnegie Mellon University and the head of its machine learning department. He is particularly known for his long track record of accurate forecasting of the flu. His work has won the CDC's annual flu forecasting challenge in four out of the past five years, and his lab was recently named by the CDC as one of two national centers of excellence for influenza forecasting. Of course, COVID-19 is at the forefront of everyone's mind in recent months, and Ronnie has been at the forefront of COVID forecasting since the beginning of the pandemic. Today, he will tell us about the science of forecasting epidemics and pandemics. Please welcome Ronnie Rosenfeld. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm just going to share. Can you all see my opening page? Yes. Okay. Uh, so thank you uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak to your group. Uh, I want to start by saying that everything we're going to talk about is the work of many people, uh, many more recently than before. Uh, so this is the work of the Delphi Research Group at Carnegie Mellon University, which uh, my colleague Ryan Shirani and I started in uh, 2012. We've been working for eight years in epidemic forecasting um, and had a variety of um, PhD and master students, occasionally undergrads, working with us. Uh, the people you see at the top here are the people who are current members of the group. Uh, postdoc, uh, recent, um, not so recent PhD anymore, uh, other PhD students um, and uh, staff. Uh, the people you see here are the people who joined us in the last two to three months uh, to help us with the COVID work. So we had an influx of um, volunteers. Um, in fact, we had more volunteers than we were able to accommodate. Uh, these are all highly, uh, highly um, sort of uh, specialized expert people who came to help us from all corners of the world. So some of them are from the West Coast. You may recognize some of the faces. Many of them are from Carnegie Mellon. Um, and um, it's thanks to them that we were able to uh, uh, move faster than we would have otherwise in the last few months. And we didn't get much sleep in those months. Um, a little word about the title here. Uh, until a few months ago, I was giving only talks about forecasting epidemics. The word pandemic wasn't there. And when people ask me about forecasting pandemics, I basically said, I don't really believe in it and I don't intend to do that. Um, and then the pandemic happened and um, I was forced to rethink that thought. So I still think it's extremely difficult, bordering maybe on impossible, but I will tell you what we have done uh, with regard to pandemics. And I know that most of the interest is in the uh, pandemic side. Now I'll, I'll describe briefly the difference between the two. Um, but um, most of my slides are actually on epidemics because we didn't have time to put slides together for a pandemic. So I will try to uh, breeze through the theory of epidemic forecasting and try to get to pandemic forecasting. And I do have a few slides on that and mostly a live demo um, to ground my discussion of that. Um, I do welcome uh, interruptions and redirections. Um, I don't look at the chat right now, but if um, it's okay if you decide that some question is worth uh, posing right away, please by all means interrupt me. Okay, so this is a, a reminder that maybe we don't need anymore in this day and age, but um, I still wanted to put it up here uh, of, um, that infectious disease mortality is still a problem. Uh, what you're seeing here is mortality rates per 100,000 people per year, uh, starting from the beginning of the 20th century. And of course, the big spike here is the 1918 uh, flu pandemic. Um, the other interesting thing that we kind of forget in the pandemic age is that there was a problem even before the pandemic, and that is the last 20 or so years, 30 years, um, there's been a consistent rise in mortality from infectious diseases. And the reason is the uh, 
um, reduce effectiveness of um, prevention measures and of antibiotics um, and the encroaching of um, viral diseases and other infectious diseases on, on human habitat, or rather the opposite, the encroaching of human habitat on where these, um, these pathogens uh, hang out. Um, so part of it is an economic and political issue, the lack of uh, investment in the pipeline of uh, new antivirals and new antibiotics. Um, I hope that uh, some of this will change in, in the wake of the pandemic. Um, maybe another reminder that we don't need, but I'll go through it quickly. Um, pandemics are a serious, serious problem. Uh, if you look at the singular events of the 20th century, the singular deadly event uh, that we can think of as uh, the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined, it killed about 100,000 people, uh, including people who died in the wake of it afterwards. Uh, the Spanish flu pandemic killed an estimated 50 million people. Um, ongoing events, Syrian civil war has been killing about 100,000 people uh, a year, uh, every year since it started. Um, regular flu before we were hit with COVID was killing about 250,000 people a year. Um, and dengue kills uh, tens of thousands and many other, uh, and of course, you know, malaria has a significant uh, mortality burden. Um, I don't know quite the background of everybody in the crowd. I'm assuming that with uh, 80 some people, at least some people are not very familiar with epidemiology. So I'm going to spend a, a bit of time um, discussing epidemiology, uh, just the part that's needed for uh, forecasting. So what's the difference between epidemics and pandemics? Uh, well, it depends on who you ask because there are different ways of uh, defining pandemics. Uh, an epidemic is defined as a rise in the prevalence of a disease or condition. So you can talk about a obesity epidemic, you can talk about a crime epidemic, uh, but usually and originally it comes from infectious diseases. Uh, and we usually talk about a rapid rise. Of course, you know, HIV was not so rapid, but uh, it depends on the time scale. A rapid rise, and often it comes in waves for reasons we may be able to, to get to later. A pandemic is a type of epidemic. Um, and the official definition is an epidemic that spreads globally. Uh, that's where the, the prefix pan comes from. But that really doesn't tell the story because even regular seasonal flu epidemics spread globally. Um, in practice, what the pandemic is, is it's, it's an epidemic that is driven by a new pathogen. And the fact that it's a new pathogen has two very important implications. One is that very little is known about it. So we don't know basic things like its modes of transmission, its inherent transmissibility, uh, its mortality rate, um, things that we, we wish we knew right, right from the start and some of them we don't even know right now for, for COVID, uh, surprisingly enough, even three months in. The other really important aspect of a new pathogen is that the population has virtually no pre-existing immunity against it. And this is, um, this is a very bad thing from a public health perspective. It's actually a good thing from a forecasting perspective. <laughs> it's easier to forecast when you have a clean slate than when you have a very complicated uh, pre-immunity picture. So pre-immunity plays a very significant role in recurring epidemics. Um, to give you a sense of it, um, flu that shows up every year uh, infects about 10% of the world population every year. About, some years half of that, some years maybe 50% more of that, so maybe 5 to 15%. And even th these numbers are known with some measure of, of uncertainty. Um, and the reason it only affects this many people is because of pre-existing immunity. So these waves of flu have been washing over us year after year after year. And they created a very complicated pattern of immunity in people. Uh, from what we know, uh, people are immune mostly against strains that they encountered early in their life. It kind of set a immunological memory. But there is a lot of crosstalk between different strains of flu. So if you're protected against one, you are partially protected against another, and you are even less or even more partially protected against uh, a more distant one. Nobody really understands that picture completely, except to know that um, if there were no immunity at all, flu would touch 70% um, of us or 80% of us before it goes away. 
Uh, and that is in fact what happened with the flu pandemic of 2009. Um, it turns out there was some pre-existing immunity for people over 60, uh, but in the younger age populations, it affected as much as 50% uh, of the population. Thankfully, it wasn't a very deadly um, pandemic. So pre-existing immunity is really important. Um, when you have it, it helps, but it makes modeling and forecasting that much more difficult. Talk a little bit about epidemics and why we thought that they could be forecast when we set out to, to start this research program. Um, epidemics are somewhat regular, but not completely regular. Uh, so flu, for example, um, varies in its pattern in different parts of the globe. In the tropics, it's uh, present year round, but it's quite erratic. It is very hard to tell when it's going uh, to spike up. Uh, but the spikes are not as uh, defined also as they are in, in other parts of the world where you have a clear wave. In the subtropics, you get the, wave, the kind of waves that we're familiar with here in the, um, in the um, temperate area, but you get them semi-regularly. Some areas get them once a year, some areas get them twice a year, depending on local climatic conditions and on other factors that we don't really understand. In temperate zones, which is where most of the US is, um, you have more regularity. You get a, uh, a flu wave every winter. But other than that, there's quite a bit of irregularity, both in timing and in intensity. So now is the time to explain that when the CDC talks about the flu season, it's really a fiction. It's a period of six to seven months from early October until April, May, during which there's generally elevated respiratory illnesses and the flu wave will almost for sure come. But when it will come is not clear. And when it comes, it doesn't last nearly that period of time. Within eight, perhaps eight to 10 weeks, most cases of the flu occur. And that could happen in November, could happen in December, January, February, March, April, and even sometimes in May. So there's regularity, but there's also a whole bit of irregularity. In intensity, there's also quite a bit of irregularity. Uh, flu can, um, uh, the dynamic range of the impact or the severity of flu measured in uh, circulation is on the order of factor of three. So a bad season, a typical bad season is three times as bad as a, a decent or, or, or a modest season. Um, you can measure um, how bad a season is by the attack rate, which is the total number of people infected by, by, by the time the wave ended. Or you can measure it by the peak, uh, peak incidence, how many people have been infected in the worst day. Um, I won't go into details about the other diseases, except to mention that every disease has its own mix of um, regularity and irregularity. That is kind of a good thing in the sense that if uh, epidemics were completely regular, then we won't have a job, they wouldn't need us, we'll know exactly when they're coming. Um, if they were completely chaotic, uh, we wouldn't be able to model them. Uh, what we observed is that they are somewhat predictable, somewhat regular, and therefore somewhat predictable. So we view our job, our research goal, as to squeeze all the regularity out, uh, so to, to reduce the uncertainty uh, in what's coming as much as possible. Why is epidemic forecasting important? Um, it, again, it feels really funny to give this talk uh, at the time where uh, I no longer need to convince people uh, that this is important, um, but um, it's worth going over these, uh, these items because they will uh, show up also in the discussion of pandemics. So there are a variety of um, stakeholders that can benefit from epidemic and pandemic forecasting. Uh, first of all, there's governments, and I mean at all levels, federal, state, city, county, um, you know, all throughout the world. Um, and uh, what governments do with this information um, beyond the pandemic question of, of uh, uh, opening and closing the, uh, the economy, which we will get to later, um, they do a lot 
it, it can influence a lot their communication strategy. So take, for example, CDC. Uh, CDC, in addition to being a coordinating uh, uh, sort of uh, force, it is very much a communication agency. A lot of its day-to-day -day work in the pre-pandemic phase uh, was to uh, send carefully timed and carefully worded messages to many, many stakeholders. They communicate to the public, they communicate to healthcare systems, they communicate to individual doctors, uh, they communicate to pharmacies, they communicate to manufacturers and so forth. And a lot around the flu season, flu is a big part of, this, of what the CDC does, they have a whole division for it. Um, a lot of, about the flu season uh, depends on the timing of the flu wave coming. So they don't want to start say vaccination campaigns too early because they will peter out. Uh, they don't want to serve them too late because they don't want to miss the boat. So timing of communication and focus of communication is actually very important for CDC. Um, then there's the usual uh, antiviral policies. Um, different countries use different policies with um, treating flu and other viral diseases. There are some antivirals that are not as effective as antibacterials. Uh, their use of prophylactically is very controversial. Some countries use them regularly, some don't. And um, when I wrote this list, school closure was considered a very extreme measure that is rarely used. Well, now it's an everyday occurrence. Um, in some other diseases, uh, mosquito control is, is a critical part of what forecasting is good for. So in mosquito-borne diseases like dengue and Zika and chikungunya, uh, the only effective strategy for uh, intervention is through a very labor-intensive process of going door-to-door, -door, educating people, getting rid of open water sources. Um, you cannot do that on large scale. You cannot do that even in one large city. You can do it in neighborhoods. So knowing when things are going to spike um, and where is very important. To healthcare providers, um, the information is even more critical and more tactical. Um, in the normal flu season, at the height of the flu wave, about 15% of beds and hospitals are taken with flu patients. As many of you know, Hospitals in the US are not designed with a lot of excess capacity. In fact, they're designed quite the opposite to not have excess capacity, to, uh, to have as close to 100% utilization as possible. That means if you're gonna have 15% of your beds with flu, you need to start planning for that by not scheduling um, elective surgery uh, for that period. Uh, make sure you have the right staff, um, plan your vacations and so forth. Um, equipment prepositioning refers to um, ventilators, which are heavily used during the flu season. Uh, of course, numbers now have changed dramatically, both demand and supply, but in the pre-COVID days, there were about 70,000 ventilators in the U.S., and in a typical flu season, about 70% of them were, were in use, uh, and we didn't want to get close to 100. Uh, some of them are uh, more movable than others. So uh, that's the prepositioning part. My favorite um, stakeholder for forecasting is actually the general public. So my favorite example is if you have a mother or grandmother, an elderly relative, um, for them, flu is, can be very deadly. Uh, this is a good time to mention that very much like COVID, um, the uh, disease rate, the, the mortality risk uh, is not distributed uniformly across the population. Uh, in the case of flu, there are four distinct high risk groups. Uh, the very old, uh, I would say starting from age 65, but really the very old from 85 and up, the risk shoots up. The very young, under six months, pregnant women, um, and people with uh, immunodeficiencies, either innate or induced by treatment. Um, it's a good time to compare it to uh, COVID. A very similar picture in COVID, uh, age is a significant factor, old age. Uh, we didn't see until recently any significant risk to young children, although by now you're all familiar with the uh, inflammatory syndrome that was discovered, but it's still a fairly low, uh, low rate. Um, pregnancy, as far as we can tell with COVID, is not a significant risk factor. 
Uh, immunodeficiency of it is unfortunately, and then we we also know of several other comorbidities that are um, significant. So back to the usage of forecasting. If your grandmother um, was planning to go visit her sister in Cleveland, and you know that um, Cleveland is about to be hit with a flu wave uh, two weeks from now, and that's when she's planning to go, then you might want to convince her to not go. Uh, and um, if you know that uh, in the next four weeks, the flu burden in her city is going to be at its worst, um, she may want to make plans. Um, in fact, I had a mother-in-law in her 90 who um, was in the um, uh, assisted living home and um, eating in a, in a dining room. And every flu season, uh, when the first two, three residents were rushed to the hospital, they would close the um, the dining room and start serving the residents in their rooms as is done now uh, for, for COVID. And I remember every year getting annoyed and saying, why do we have to wait until the first three uh, should go to, to the hospital? We can certainly do now casting and tell them when it's in their city and we can even give them a week or two uh, heads up. So our, our vision is to make uh, uh, epidemic forecasting, a regular uh, tool that people use, like to use uh, weather forecasting. A little bit about our, our Delphi Research Group. I already told you about our vision. Uh, we are Carnegie Mellon faculty and students uh, from a variety of backgrounds, machine learning, computer science, statistics, computational biology. All our code is publicly released as open source. All our visualization tools are on the web, have been for ever since we started. Uh, and all our forecasts are, made, are posted publicly in real time. And I should mention that we have, as I mentioned earlier, that we have been strengthened significantly in the last few months by people, uh, including from outside Carnegie Mellon. Epidemic forecasting has been coming of age in the last uh, eight years. Uh, the CDC started the annual competition in 2013. Uh, maybe the most important thing about those competitions is that when they started, there were seven submissions, and uh, the last year they were run, there were over 40 submissions. Uh, DARPA ran a competition, the White House Office of Science Technology Policy ran a competition for dengue. Um, perhaps uh, the most important point is in 2017, uh, the CDC, sorry, the CDC started incorporating flu forecast into their regular weekly updates to their leadership and to the public. So that indicated a, maybe a psychological shift. Until then, they were just playing with us in their backyard, seeing, you know, trying, testing it out, seeing if it's reliable enough. In 2017, they decided it's good enough uh, to become part of their regular offerings. Um, I think Kay already mentioned that they established two national centers of flu forecasting. We were fortunate to be chosen to be one of them. University of Massachusetts at Amherst is the second one. Um, and then 2020, all of a sudden we found ourselves in the in the floodlight. Uh, all of a sudden everybody everybody cares about what we do. Um, types of epidemic forecasting. So the first type and the one that I'm trying to rush through to get to is the pandemic forecasting, the kind that I told you I don't believe is possible. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the other types of, um, of forecasting, regular epidemics. Uh, the one type that I often get questions about is across season forecasting. Uh, one of the most important things we can do is if we can forecast the dominant strains of flu next season, and if we can do it at least nine months before the season, the, before the wave arrives, then we can be sure that the vaccines we develop have a good match. Uh, right now, the sort of a track record of matching the strain is okay, 70, 80%, uh, but it's 70, 80% because every, you know, the, flu, the dominant flu strain only changes every three or four years. So if you just choose a strategy of, of don't, don't change, uh, you will get very close to that. Um, we have not tried to beat that. Uh, it's pretty hard to do, and um, I, I, can, I can talk about it during Q&A. Most of our work was within season. And within season, uh, you can um, think about multiple um, 
uh, sort of types of forecasting. You can th think about near casting, which is probably, which is basically short term forecasting, forecasting for the next few weeks. Uh, you can try to forecast the rest of the season, including answering questions like when will the peak arrive and how bad will the peak be and what will the attack rate be when it's all over. But uh, one thing you need to do before you look at the future is look at the present and the past. And that's what now casting and back casting are about. So this is something that it takes a while to appreciate the, the difference between epidemic forecasting and say weather forecasting. In weather forecasting, the past and the present are not a problem in principle. Uh, they can be measured and they are measured. Uh, of course, it's a big logistic operation. There's a 3D grid all over the planet that sends continuous measurements of temperatures and wind and humidity and whatnot. Um, and that's, uh, it took many, many years, maybe decades of collaboration between governments, but it's pretty much a solved problem. We can measure whatever we need for, uh, for weather forecasting about the past and about the present. And we can focus only on the future, on how the past and the present lead to the future. Not so in epidemic forecasting. In epidemic forecasting, there is a very significant amount of uncertainty about the present. Nobody really knows how many people have COVID or flu, for that matter, uh, it, on any one day or any one week in any one city. And probably nobody will know for sure in the future either. And even in the past, we have a fair amount of uncertainty. So this is what this uh, image um, is trying to capture that uncertainty in epidemics and epidemiology is, um, of course, greater in the future, but it's really quite significant also in the past and the present, which leads to differences in um, methodology and technical approach to forecasting epidemics. So a lot of our work focused on what we call now casting on trying to estimate as accurately as possible the current state of any epidemic um, in any location, and by extension, all, also to uh, backcasting. Um, and that estimation is not a point estimation. Uh, we're really talking about distributional estimation, so assigning sort of uncertainty uh, or whole distribution to what we think is happening here. And because um, epidemics are dynamic uh, time processes, we're really talking about distribution over trajectories. So I'd like to ask you to start thinking now, not about individual um, targets, individual points uh, in the future, such as how many people will be affected by the time the wave is over, is over or what week would be the worst week, but in terms of trying to uh, project or forecast an entire trajectory. And that means from the past to the present to the future. And of course, this is a latent variable. So there's a whole distribution of trajectories here and we want to extend the distribution trajectories into the future. I spoke a bit about targets. Uh, there are lots of different things you can try to forecast. Um, when we started, the CDC asked us to focus on a few specific things. Um, how bad is the season going to be measured by the peak intensity or how high is the highest point? When will we reach that peak intensity? How long would the epidemic, the wave last? Uh, and the wave is defined by some thresholds of when it starts and when it ends. And what would be the expected intensity or uh, incidence in the next four weeks? Uh, a few week, a few years into those exercises, the uh, CDC decided to drop the third component. How long? Uh, it turns out that it was not that useful to them. So we remained with seven targets. Uh, one, two, three, and four weeks into the future. Um, how bad the season is going to be? When will it be that bad? And one that's not mentioned here is when is the start start date? When will it cross a certain threshold? To talk a little bit about how we measure our accuracy, um, if you make point predictions, you can think of measures like you know L1 absolute error or L2 or some other measure. Um, we do keep track of such measures, but we focus on distributional predictions. And with distributional predictions, rather than giving you a single answer, we give you a distribution over all possible answers. And when you get a distributional prediction, you need to decide on the scoring rule. There's a whole theory of, uh, of scoring. 
um, you want your soil rule to be proper. That means it should have the property that the, the best you, your, your best expected score would be the one that matches your expectations. So you, basically, there's no way of gaming it. But within proper scores, there are a variety of choices. The one that we convinced the CDC to use right from the beginning is the likelihood for the log score. It basically corresponds to maximizing the log likelihood of the future according to your model. So it should be very familiar to machine learning types. Um, I have to say that this uh, score does have some uh, deficiencies. Uh, specifically, it cares an awful lot about rare events. So if you have a rare event, um, it's really important if, if the event has a probability, say, of 1% of happening. Uh, if you claim that it had a probability of one, you know, 100th of 1%, you're going to suffer significantly if it happens. So knowing the action, the absolute, uh, I'm sorry, knowing the relative um, size of our event is very important, even in the extreme tail. Um, this may or may not be what you want. Uh, there is no correct answer to the question of scoring. It really all depends on your payoff matrix and on decisions you're trying to make. So we are now with the consultation with the CDC are considering either moving to or expanding to other uh, proper scores. I mentioned a little bit um, the different types of um, approaches that have been used for uh, modeling epidemics and therefore extending them to forecasting epidemics. Perhaps the most famous uh, and most used methodology for understanding epidemics and trying to forecast them is uh, through what's called complementary models. Uh, I assume most of you are familiar with SIR, SEIR, and all their hundreds of cousins. Uh, the idea there is that you only keep track of what fraction of the population is in any one of a finite number of states, uh, and there are stochastic transitions between the states. So in the simplest, almost simplest model, you are either susceptible, waiting to be infected, or you are infectious and actively infected, or you are recovered. And of course, if you're recovered, you can have waning immunity and become susceptible again. So that's the SIR. Um, these models have been in use for at least 100 years. There's a very well-developed mathematical theory for explaining them. They are they make oversimplified assumptions. The, the most egregious is the one of, of perfect mixing. That means that um, every person is interacting equally often with every other person. Uh, there are some piecemeal corrections to that. We can cr create different uh, compartments for different types of people. You can create compartments for different age groups uh, because they mix differently. Um, it's hard to estimate some of the parameters um, that's in terms of modeling. Uh, one of the most important parameters I'm sure you all heard about is R0 or RT, the, the um, basic reproductive number, uh, which is related to the uh, rate of growth of an epidemic. These are things that are uh, numerically very unstable to estimate at the beginning of an epidemic. Um, beyond that, my personal feeling is that SIR models are not very good, uh, not very suitable for forecasting. They're very good for explaining what's happening, but as a technological tool, uh, my feeling is that they're not, um, uh, they will not perform as well relative to the other models I will describe. Um, most forecasts you find out there on the web now are SIR models when you, when you look deep at them. And, and, and they can be fixed in a variety of ways. We can talk about that. But um, the underlying perfect mixing assumption is just a very unrealistic assumption. You know, people are not perfectly mixed at, at any level of granularity. Um, and the other extreme, you have um, basically simulations, uh, individual level simulations. For some unfortunate reason, they are known in the field as agent-based models. This is a, a um, terrible um, sort of a it causes terrible confusion because in computer science, agents are completely different things. Uh, but here, the word agent basically means an individual. So these are simulations of entire populations of cities or states or countries or even the whole world 
uh, where you have people living in households and getting up in the morning and going to work or to school and, and interacting there with other people uh, and coming back home and maybe going out into the community and interacting there. And uh, the advantage of this is that um, you can model anything you want, right? It's a simulation of the real world. It's a little bit like the sim game. You can, you can model things with any uh, level of detail, anything that you think matters to the spread of epidemics. Uh, the disadvantage is that uh, there are so many parameters, so many choices in your modeling, um, and it is very hard for us to fit these parameters to data because um, many of these um, are either non-identifiable or identifiable, but we don't have enough data uh, for them. So agent-based models also, until recently, did not prove very accurate for uh, for forecasting epidemics. Um, one of the biggest obstacles for agent-based models is the existing of uh, uh, pre-existing immunity. If you remember, we talked about regular epidemics that occur every year. There's a very complex um, um, sort of uh, background of pre-existing immunity that affects different people differently, and uh, we just don't know how to measure it and don't know how to capture it. But this gives you a hint that in a pandemic situation, they actually relatively have a, a stronger standard. The third class of models is uh, what is known in the field as non-mechanistic models. Uh, namely, models that don't take too seriously the um, understanding of the mechanism of epidemic spread. Your classic, some of you may smile, but your classic machine learning approach of you know, I don't believe the story, let me just look at the data. So much more emphasis on historical data than on understanding. Of course, it's not either or, you can combine them. But uh, if you take it to an extreme, you can do something like Sarima, so a, a large family of uh, autoregressive uh, time series models. Um, and you can just throw Sarima at it. And this is what a lot of epidemiologists have been doing, as well as uh, economists, econometricians, and so forth. Um, does that work better? Well, it worked better for us. Uh, our approach is based almost entirely on non-mechanistic means. Um, still, we still make you still make assumptions there. And for example, the S in Sarima corresponds to seasonal, and flu is seasonal in some sense, but it's not really periodic because the wave doesn't come at the same time every season. So if you just index things by calendar week, uh, it's not going to help you. Um, the other maybe bigger um, sort of challenge is that you need historical data. Uh, with flu, the, one of the reasons we started working with flu is because there's more data about flu, especially historically, than about any other uh, infectious disease. Um, but of course, when you have a pandemic situation, you get stuck. And uh, we did get stuck. We'll go to that. Maybe the most interesting approach is the last one. Uh, which was introduced to the field um, more recently, um, and that's data assimilation methods. So the, the weather forecasting uh, field has discovered it a long time ago. Uh, what they do basically is they believe the theory, but only up to a point. So in fact, in the case of weather forecasting, uh, the theory is not very not non-controversial. You have Navier Stokes equations that basically drive everything. Um, the um, fact that they're not perfect is not because the theory is not perfect, it's because the measurement is not perfect, there's chaos uh, involved, so they need correction. In the case of um, epidemic modeling, you can start from your basic equations, but the basic equations themselves are not perfect. But either way, uh, you don't get very far with the theory by itself. Um, but what you can do is trust the data, but keep adjusting your models to it. So common filters kind of do that, especially ensemble common filters, where you have a large number of common filters, each parameterized slightly differently. Uh, particle filters is a, is a, a, a technique for uh, keeping track of a distribution and um, allowing yourself to inform it, uh, not only by current data that you're simulating, but also by changes in your parameters that you're treating as if they were data, sort of a basic approach. So I think data assimilation methods are the future. Um, we have not done much in that area. Uh, most of our work is in the 
sort of classic non-mechanistic. I think I talked enough about the, the field, may give you some technical uh, a flavor of what we have done, um, of some of the techniques we've used. Uh, I'll do it very lightly. Uh, we've, over the last eight years, we've developed maybe five or six or seven different techniques, um, kept improving them, but never really got rid of the old ones. So our current methodology is actually an ensemble or a, uh, a stack of models. Uh, so I'll describe some of the components of this methodology. Um, this is actually the very first one we developed. Um, it's a very simple empirical based framework. Um, we are basically saying that um, we're, we're starting by a, a simple assumption that uh, the current season will look like a past season, maybe with some changes. And of course, the some changes is the critical part. What kind of changes are we aligned? So you're seeing here, um, example of uh, some 16, 17 flu seasons. Um, you can see how they differ from one another. Uh, what is hard to see is that the peaks are actually in quite different times. Um, remember that uh, each square is about five months. So uh, you get the peak at different times during those five months, although there is a, um, a popularity of the February, March timeframe. Um, so we're going to assume that this season looks like a past season, uh, which means that uh, we can define a prior over all trajectories for this season. And um, the prior is going to be defined um, operationally. We can sample from that prior. Uh, we're going to assume that the seasons uh, are, um, that the past seasons are RID trajectories. So we're going to um, form a prior over the, these trajectories, um, somewhat empirically informed, I will mention that later. We're gonna estimate a noise model, and then we're going to observe uh, whatever portion of the current season is available, compare it with uh, the beginning of the um, trajectory that we sampled from our prior, and this will give us a likelihood. Uh, and the prior and the likelihood give us something that's proportional to the posterior, and this will give us a posterior distribution over the rest of the season. So here is a recipe for how we do that. We choose uniformly at random one of the seasons. Um, we um, transform, oh no, I didn't. Yeah, let me start from this one. We shift and scale it by a random amount within reasonable limits. So we picked one of the seasons and then we say that the current season could be the same, but maybe started a few weeks earlier, a few weeks later, and maybe it was the same overall shape, but it uh, stretched a bit up or down. Uh, so we actually allow three operations, a shift, a vertical scale, and a horizontal scale, and the limits of those operations are empirically um, derived from, from the empirical data that we have. So there's cross-validated, you could say. Um, and then we um, weigh the trajectory that we got uh, against the data points that we have, what, match how well it, um, see how well it matches, um, and then draw the rest of the curve, adding noise to it, and the noise parameters are again estimated from the data. So let me, maybe an example would make it clearer. Uh, we are now in the middle of the season. We are right here, which is week uh, 46. Um, these are observations. Uh, I'm cheating a bit here because if you remember, I told you that we don't actually have exact observations, that we don't really know what is happening right now. And in fact, there's a fair amount of uncertainty with regard to the last observation. And there's also uncertainty with regard to previous observations. Uh, there's a good amount of uncertainty even four, five, six weeks back. Uh, but for now, we ignore that and we assume that these are observations. Uh, Every time we draw a, um, a trajectory from our prior and shift it and stretch it, we compare it against these data points uh, using a Gaussian noise model. Um, this gives us a weight. And then we draw the rest of this trajectory as one, um, one little spaghetti in this spaghetti bowl. Um, one way in which the spaghetti bowl is, one thing it's not showing is that the 
each trajectory of the future has a weight, a posterior weight. And those weights can have a significant dynamic range. Some of them would be very, very low and negligible. Some of them might be quite significant. Uh, that's hard to show with the thickness of these lines, but it's easy to compute over. And then we can, uh, we basically have a posterior distribution of futures and we can compute whatever we want over that posterior distribution. Here, what we chose to compute is a, a pointwise mean and a pointwise 95% credible interval. Um, so maybe you can look at this and say, well, you don't know very much. Things could be anything. And that is pretty true uh, at that point. Uh, but that um, posterior distribution is very um, flexible because it allows you to compute a posterior uh, forecast over any target of interest. So here's an example target. Uh, what would be the onset week of the current uh, season? Onset is defined relative to a particular threshold that varies from location to location and even from year to year, but it's pre-calculated by the CDC at the beginning of the season. And onset is defined as the epidemic wave exceeding that threshold and staying there for at least three weeks. So it's a fairly complicated definition, sort of non-linear definition. But when you have your method of sampling from the posterior at hand, you can calculate any statistic over it. So uh, here I got rid of all the spaghetti, left maybe 10 of them uh, for clarity. Um, you can see, you can calculate, you can take each one of these spaghettis, calculate when it crosses the onset definition uh, and drop that point in the histogram here. So what you get here is a histogram of possible onset weeks. And what you can tell is that we don't know nothing. Uh, the onset could be pretty much anywhere, very broad distribution. You could choose to calculate the posterior mean, and that's the blue line and the observes happen to be very close to it. Maybe you were lucky. Um, there's very small absolute error of the mean. Um, but the nice thing about it is that you can now update your forecast every week when you have new data and you can repeat the process and you can compare them. So here's a week later, same process. We draw 100,000 uh, priors, convert them to 100,000 posteriors, convert them into a distribution and uh, you can see how your uncertainty goes down. Um, and uh, now you can start saying something meaningful about when, when the onset might be. You're basically quantifying your uncertainty. Um, and of course, you're not completely uh, removed your uncertainty until you actually cross the threshold. And if you notice, there's some uh, possibility here. This has to do with crossing and then going down again. You can repeat that for every target uh, of interest. Um, let me stop here for a moment and um, see if there are any questions, specifically if you uh, are all thinking, when will he ever be done with the epidemics and move to COVID? Uh, that's fine. I can skip over the rest and go straight to COVID. Uh, if you want to hear about more methods, I can do that as well. Are there any questions? Um, I wondered, um, this is uh, Kevin Murphy at Google, I wondered if you could mention briefly a bit more about the data assimilation and how it connects, how, you know, how they, you combine data with mechanistic models. You said you think it's the future, right? And I know like common filters are applied to linear Gaussian state space models, which doesn't sound like a good fit for the mechanistic mechanisms you have in mind. So um, there are several ways in which common filters were extended. Uh, um, uh, one is to uh, approximate the linear uh, process model. Another is by adding um, ensembles. Uh, and the ensembles uh, vary over not just the state space, but also the parameters of the model. So uh, I'm actually describing here work of uh, Jeff Shaman at uh, Columbia University. Uh, we have not done that. Um, they treat, they take an SIR model, uh, has a handful of parameters. They treat the parameters as, um, as data basically, as random variables. And the ensemble varies over both the parameters and the state space. So it's an extended state space. Um, mm -hmm. There's 
some more work about that. None of it is ours. So I just wanted to clarify that point. Um, I would like to talk about um, data assimilation in a different sense. Uh, it's not a common field of data assimilation, but literally data assimilation for solving a null casting problem. So that's actually what is by default my kind of topic. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? <clears throat> All right, I guess we're ready to move on. All right, so let me focus on now casting. Uh, not surprising, now casting is a very large part of what we do. Uh, in fact, um, in some sense, you really have to solve now casting before you even begin to attempt forecasting. Um, give you a sense of where now casting comes out of, um, in a typical flu year, you may have uh, a variety of flu waves, epidemics happening at the same time. You may have other influenza-like illnesses, other respiratory viruses, some of them have very similar symptoms. Uh, and they may have, here the waves look similar, I didn't mean for them to be similar, they could be a different timing, different intensity, and you may be at a different point through them. So it's a really a, a, hor a horrid mess of a respiratory illnesses, each doing their own thing, with relatively little crosstalk between them, although there is some. And they all contribute to this uh, variable that I called number of ILI. That's a technical term from the technology. It means influenza-like illness. Number of people who present with, uh, who have influenza-like uh, symptoms. So that would typically be fever above a certain threshold plus a sore throat or cough. Uh, there's also now a, a parallel term called CLI, COVID-like illness, which is slightly different. Um, sore throat is not, does not feature high there, but loss of smell and taste do, and um, fever is not as, uh, as distinct. So there's a, a slightly different um, signature, but nonetheless, the two are highly overlapping. Of the people who uh, have these symptoms, only a fraction go to the doctor. Um, so some of them uh, don't go because they, they don't have time, they don't have medical coverage, they don't need to, so distribution is very skewed. But there's a, some number that I called number of ILI office visits. And this is the first time that uh, a case is uh, medically attended, that's the technical term, where the, the healthcare system pays attention to it. But of course, we all know that um, people behave in different ways before they go to the doctor and um, their classic by now uh, measurements of um, queries in Google and of thermometer sales and a variety of other public media and software sources. Um, they all have some information, whether it's useful or not, whether it's dangerous or not, that's still an open question, but there's definitely a a lot of information to mine and try to analyze there. Um, following on this, um, I should mention that people who go to the doctor for flu don't usually get tested for flu. So the fact that they were seen by a doctor does not mean that you know whether they had flu or not. And remember, you do want to know if it's flu or not because flu is much more deadly than uh, other respiratory illnesses that may look the same. Um, only some fraction of them get to the hospital either from the doctor visits or directly to the emergency department. Uh, of those who are hospitalized, some fraction become respirated. Of those, some fraction die. It is eerie to think how familiar this picture is now. The people, I, I drew this about eight years ago and had to spend a lot of time explaining it to people, but I think now it's like bread and butter. Everybody, everybody knows this trajectory. Um, so our goal is to really use whatever is measurable here and to go back to here, to the height of this and do this for the past so that we can continue that line. So that's a, a formidable goal. Um, traditional surveillance is very insufficient for accurate now casting. Uh, traditional public health surveillance, which is very important, very, very useful, 
uh, it's not really designed for real-time full understanding of uh, disease severity. It has built-in um, uh, latencies that are there for an important reason because there's a whole theory of how you check cases and trace them and verify them and so forth. Um, but um, what you're seeing here is a very typical difference in estimation of uh, percent of doctors who have uh, who percent of doctor visits that are due to ILI, due to influenza like illness. And um, these are measures of the same thing except um, one week apart. So at the end of week, epidemic week three of 2015, actually in, in the end of epidemic week four of 2015, CDC publishes the first time its estimate of um, uh, the percent of ILI for week three. Uh, and it also updates its estimates for week two, week one, and previous year. And then a week later, it publishes this, and the differences are quite severe. So this is where digital surveillance comes in more handy. It has far less uh, latent latency, although it, it does have some. Um, and it, it cuts out the one to two weeks that the first data points from uh, public surveillance are available. Uh, this is the list of um, digital surveillance sources that we have used in our work. Google was kind enough to share with us their um, uh, Google Health Friends interface, which is not publicly available. Um, the Twitter signal we got through collaboration with a group at Johns Hopkins, healthpeaks.org. Uh, we scraped Wikipedia pages ourselves, uh, continuing to do that, and uh, CDC provided us with the uh, access statistics for uh, access to CDC's own pages about influenza. Uh, and there were a variety of other sources that we had on and off. Uh, a lot of our work, I would say a lot of my work, was about trying to identify and procure new data sources. And in fact, this has become uh, a full-time job in the last few months, uh, just to constantly look for new data sources for COVID. Um, these different um, proxy data sources, as we call them, are quite noisy. Uh, what you're seeing here is these sources, after they have been fitted, on historical data, uh, and this is their performance on new data. So this is the, the best sort of uh, uh, univariate regression for each one of them. Um, not only are they noisy, but they also, the error tends to be correlated. So this may not be surprising if uh, there's some news event about flu or some celebrity got the flu, um, you can expect a spike in web searches, you can stay, potentially expect a spike in Twitter, but you will not get a spike in doctor visits uh, or in thermometer sales. So there is a complex um, covariance structure between these, um, these different predictors or different indicators. And one of the things uh, that we proved the most useful for us is to try to study and estimate this covariance structure so you can invert it. Um, another problem that you have with these estimators is that they are intermittent. They're not all available all the time. Google flu trends uh, was stopped uh, in the middle of 2015. Um, some other uh, uh, sources are available only part of the year. Some other sources only became available at a certain time. So if you were trying to do just general multivariate regression uh, and um, you were trying to intersect when all the covariates are available, you would end up with a very, very small training data. So you don't want to do that. You want to somehow benefit from um, all the data that's available. Another problem with these sources is they come with different geographic resolution. So um, Google Flu Trends and Google Health Trends are available at the level of state and also uh, marketing regions, which are not that relevant here. Um, Twitter, I think is available at the level of regions. Wikipedia is a tough one. Uh, it has very fine temporal resolution and very high volume, but it has absolutely no geographic resolution. We've been begging the Wikimedia Foundation for years to release some IP, some information from IP access so we can have some geographic information. It's stuck in the bowels of the organization. Um, so we still found it a useful signal. 
uh, but it's useful for the US as a whole. And on and on, different, different signals have different geographic resolution. So you find yourself in a situation where you're trying to combine maybe 10 different signals. Each one has a different error pattern, different geographic resolution, different latency, and in some cases, different temporal resolution. Some of them are available daily, some of them are available weekly, and so forth. The approach we took to it, Kevin, back to your question, is a data simulation approach. Um, we basically we took, um, um, you can call it sensor fusion, although in different fields, people use sensor fusion to refer to slightly different things. You can think about it as taking common filter. And uh, I think one of the best things we did in the common filter is we threw away half of it. So a common filter has both a process model and a um, measurement model or noise model. And we threw away the process model completely. And here's the reason why. When you work in a domain that has a solid um, theory, like physics-based theory, like weather forecasting, there is no controversy about what the process model is. You may need to measure the parameters, but there's agreement about what the process is. In epidemic forecasting, there is no clear agreement about what a good process model is. In fact, we don't have the gold process model of an epidemic. I mean, you can use compartmental models, but they're not very accurate. You can use um, uh, time series models like SARIMA, but not very accurate. So we decided instead of having to choose between them, uh, we will throw away all of them, or more accurately, we will treat each process model, we will let each process model make a prediction and treat that prediction as if it were yet another measurement. So instead of having a common filter with one process model and five measurements, or having three process models and five measurements, we have zero process models and eight measurements. This is the approach we took. Um, so this is a bit of um, a reminder of the math of, uh, of a common filter. Uh, we basically took the process model and gave it infinite variance so that the past doesn't matter. You're starting every time from scratch. So this becomes effectively just sensor fusion. You have, in our case, eight measurements. You have some um, measure of their error. Um, common filter. You can see we're taking the Q um, process noise to infinity. This actually simplifies the equations. Um, and what we end up with is a, uh, in hindsight, quite simple uh, model that says that the latent state um, of the system is, um, is estimated as a multivariate Gaussian over the state space. The state space consists of the uh, uh, most refined geographic division of any one of the measurements. So if even one of the measurements is at a county level, then the state space is county level. Um, you can see here the um, sources of the measurement that we use. So I mentioned Google Clue Trends, Google Health Trends, Twitter. You can see the geographic resolution at which they're available. So the way to think about it is that uh, Google, let's say Google Health Trends, is available uh, as 51 different measurements, one for the US as a whole and 50 for each one of the states. Um, HHS is the 10 regions of the US that the uh, Department of Health and Human Services uses. Um, and then these three are process models. I can say a few words about them. SAR3 is exactly what it sounds like. It's an autoregressive, seasonal autoregressive model with uh, three, um, three component, three uh, covariates. Uh, this is a um, call it archetype. It's um, kind of a common filter, really pretty close to a common filter model. Uh, this is a wisdom of crowds method that I don't have time to talk about now, but maybe in Q&A. So we have a parallel process for wisdom of crowds and we use that as one of our uh, supposed processes. So now they're treated as measurements. And then we do our basically the fusion step of the common filter um, to update or to recreate the, um, the uh, Gaussian uh, both uh, mean and the covariance matrix. 
And then if we're interested in reading out any particular distribution over any location, uh, we basically do it by marginalizing over everything else and reading out a state, a census region, a US region, and so forth. Um, what else so can I think about this? Um, um, so about a year or two after this was published, um, our group, um, led by Ryan Tipshirani and, and some of our students, uh, observed that um, this approach can be viewed as uh, multivariate uh, regression with some regularization constraints. Uh, the regularization constraints have to do, not surprisingly, with um, linear constraints on the uh, on the betas uh, corresponding to particular regions uh, being normalized. So that if many, many um, of the measurements uh, uh, involve a particular state, uh, that doesn't, uh, so, so it, it's a constrained regression problem, not a regular regression problem. And uh, that was published as well. I uh, hope I have a citation here. Kevin, I thought you had a question there. Oh yeah, here it is. Uh, this is the um, um, derivation of the equivalence to um, multiple linear regression with, with constraints. Um, yeah, my question was on the relative weights, how important the different data, the different data sources are. So in common filtering and presumably in the, in the weight regularized regression, each data source has a certain amount of importance. Are they learned or set by cross-validation or equal? They're learned. They're learned. And um, as, as usual, the weights don't tell you necessarily the, significant, the, the impact of, of withdrawing them, right? Because there's collinearities. I can show you ablation experiments later where we took out one source at a time and you can see that all sources are not equal. Some of them are much more important than others. Oh, this is exactly what you're showing here. This is perfect. Yeah. So you do the full matrix? I'm sorry? This is the do full you matrix. Estimate yeah. this? Oh, okay. And this is, you're doing this by maximum marginal likelihood? I mean, like an EM method or it's a... No. So if you talk about estimating the, the covariance matrix, um, you remember that um, the data is not all available for, for at the same period of time for everything. So what yeah. we do is we look at the uh, error correlation of any two sources and we use it to estimate a standard maximum likelihood estimation of uh, the covariance of these two sources. Then we plug it into a covariance matrix, and of course you don't get a real covariance matrix because it's not consistent, it's based on different data. So then, and in fact, it, it's most likely it's not even positive definite. So then we shrink that matrix towards a positive definite one. Um, or in, a, in an early version, we shrank it until it became positive definite. Uh, we later found out that if you shrink beyond that, you actually do better. So there are actually a variety of ways, I think I may have a slide about them. Yeah, here it is. Uh, a variety of ways to estimate covariances from uh, pairwise um, methods. We just choose one simple, we never actually went, uh, this is on our list to see if there are better, better ways of doing that. Uh, all right, here is the result. This is what you saw already. The black line is the ground truth. The, Colorful lines are the various um, uh, individual measurements or estimators. And um, here's the reconstruction over uh, five seasons. Uh, the black line, again, is the ground truth. The red line is our real-time reconstruction. Uh, to impress upon you how successful this is, I will point out that the black line is not known until the end of the flu season. Um, it is only um, determined by CDC in late June, early July, um, because the revision process keeps going on for many, many weeks, sometimes for 10, 14, 20 weeks. Now, of course, the, the amount of revision goes down with time, so it is known gradually over time, but it's not finalized. It's not declared final until... Um, the middle of the summer, where of course it's not useful for anything except historical record. Um, and uh, the red is our real-time estimate. Here are the ablation experiments that um, I was talking about. 
Uh, this is the performance. This is a uh, mean squared error, mean absolute error. Um, these are the eight uh, sources. To remind you, only five of them are sources. The other three are um, really processes, process models that are masquerading as, as measurements. Um, here is each one of them on their own. Here is as you add one at a time. Let me get to the ablation. Here's the ablation on the right. So, um, does anybody see the winner? So, SAR3 is the one you don't want to give up. So SAR3 is basically the model that looks at the last three measurements of the last three weeks and some measurements from uh, previous season. Um, the take home message is not that a time series is all we need, uh, but it is that this, this measure is uh, complementary to many of the other measures. So many of the other measures don't have any memory. They, they look at people behavior and, and digital footprint and so forth. This is a, basically a measure of continuity from the past. Lots of uh, reporting here. We have a website that, um, called ILI nearby that has been up and running since uh, 2016 and gives uh, twice a week updates on the level of flu and the level of uh, uh, states and, um, and the regions. Um, it, been since superseded by our COVID tracking, which is what I would like to develop, devote the rest of my time to if I have any. So how are we doing on time and what do we want to talk about? Um, so we still have uh, 12 minutes remaining. Okay, let me devote it all to, um, to COVID. Um, I love this slide. Uh, this is inspired, this is my slide, but it's inspired by Nate Silver's book, uh, it talks about why forecasting in one field are successful and others are not, uh, based on how strong the theory is and how adequate the data is. And uh, if you are, my group's charge is moving this from here to here. Um, and I'll leave it at that and let's talk about pandemic forecasting. So um, what are the challenges in, in the pandemic forecasting? One is that there's almost no relevant historical training data. So machine learning methods are at a huge disadvantage relative to other methods. And this is one reason why we haven't yet put a uh, forecast, even though many other groups did. Um, that's not what our tools were built for. Um, our solution uh, to this is instead of generalizing across time to generalize across locations. So um, of course we have tried shrinking across locations, our parameters, it hasn't been that successful in the past, um, but when you don't have historical depth, um, that, that's really the only thing you have. So we need a little bit of time. Um, so we need to look at the last few months and as, as time progresses, we're gonna have more and more training data, but we're mostly gonna rely on multiple locations rather than multiple seasons. The other big challenge is that there has been a drastic change in the relationship between covariates and targets. So a lot of the work we've done was on how people's use on, of Wikipedia or of, um, other uh, websites or of Google searches uh, or of purchasing behavior, uh, how are they related to what we're interested in? And everything changed in the last few months. So relationships that were there before are not there anymore. The drastic changes in the healthcare system in how patients are being seen or being talked with rather than seen, uh, telemedicine and so forth. Uh, where they've been directed to, and of course, people's reaction and how they, they behave. So the, this has been a huge, huge challenge because you need to start a lot of these um, uh, estimates from scratch. The silver lining of all of this is there's a tremendous amount of goodwill during the pandemic crisis situation. So we, I already mentioned, we have a huge number of volunteers, um, data providers. I spent a lot of my life the last five years begging stealing, I don't know, but definitely begging uh, for data. Um, and it's a very slow and difficult process, especially if you don't have millions of dollars to spend on it. Um, this has changed. A lot of data providers are now either coming to us or are, when we approach them are extremely cooperative, pro bono, 
uh, and going way out of the way to give us data and even the last obstacle, the lawyers negotiate the data use agreements and the restrictions and all that go well out of the way to do the work quickly and impose minimal restrictions. So as a result, we were able to secure access to many data sources in the last three months that I wouldn't have dreamed to be able to do in, in, in five or 10 years. Um, a bit about our, the strategy we, we charted for uh, forecasting uh, COVID. Um, the first one is the now casting part. And we can't even do now casting because now casting implies some kind of supervised learning to learn the current state. Um, I guess it doesn't even have to be supervised, but you have to have a notion of what the ground truth is so you know how good your now casting is. Well, we don't have a ground truth. Nobody has a ground truth. Nobody knows the ground truth. And I think it's going to be a long time before any kind of ground truth will emerge. Even the most basic, supposedly clean things like how many people died of COVID are not that simple. And there's a fair amount of disagreement over them. So uh, our response to that was to back a little bit away from claiming now casting and instead to talk about indicators. Building a set of indicators, process covariates that show promise, that show a significant relationship to the reality of COVID at various levels um, and just leave it out there for other people to use and draw their own conclusions as well as the starting point for our own forecasting work. And I will show you in the remaining time the site that we built with our indicators. The second part of our strategy is regarding forecasting itself. And here we decided to focus on what matters for decision making. We felt early on that the targets of importance are the demands on hospitals and specifically on ICUs and ventilators, because these are the bottlenecks of our healthcare system and in the uh, difficult decisions that lie ahead in the coming year on whether how much to open the economy and whether to reclose it and so forth, um, the eyes should be on the target. And the target, in my mind at least, is uh, the bottleneck of the healthcare system. Because once you have no more ICU beds, and we're not talking only about beds, we're talking about the equipment that goes with it and the nurses that go with it and the trained personnel, pulmonologists and respiratory therapists and the whole ecosystem, once you uh, overwhelm them, your, your death rate is going to shoot up considerably. Uh, and that would happen with ICU before it happens to overall hospital admission. So there's some elasticity in the system. We've noticed in the last three months that the system capacity has grown, but it's still the bottleneck. So this is what we're focusing on. The second uh, part of our um, sort of strategy is to focus on local decision making because we feel that again in the coming 12 months or so, these decisions will have to be made at the local level. And by local, we mean either county or above county, metropolitan area level, hospital referral region level, uh, which is the level at which hospitals can easily transfer patients and so forth. And the third decision we made was regarding a time frame. Uh, we decided to go for a four week time frame. Uh, CDC has asked us to try to expand it to six weeks. Um, I'm not confident that we can do that with any degree of sort of reliability and accuracy, but, but we can try. We felt that four weeks is a reasonable compromise in terms of it's feasible uh, for our models to give relatively modest uh, uncertainty bands uh, for four weeks. And at the same time, four weeks is uh, actionable in the sense that if you give decision makers a heads up that they are going to exceed their capacity with a, a decent likelihood um, in four weeks, they can still take action now uh, that will affect what happens four weeks from now. It may not affect what happens in the next two weeks, but it will affect what happens in four weeks. So this is what we settled on. Uh, we are still in the process of working on our forecast. There are lots of technical and logistic uh, issues, some of them having to do with where do you get your numbers to validate your forecast. Tremendous amount of uncertainty about uh, especially hospitalization data. Uh, it's very hard to come by. But let me use um, the rest of the time to show you um, what we have done so far for developing indicators. So let me um, move to, do you see a beautiful map of the US? Yeah. 
Do you care? Okay. Uh, sorry, one second. So this is our website where we publish our indicators in real time. Um, it is called COVIDcast. Uh, these are, if you see, they're called indicators. Um, first one is based on uh, outpatient visits. So uh, it measures the percentage of doctor's visits that are due to COVID-like symptoms uh, in any particular county. You can click on a county and get a uh, time picture. You can load more time and see basically the beginning of the, um, of the pandemic period. Uh, you can, uh, we only provide estimates when we have uh, sufficient data. Uh, if we don't, we lump all the remaining counties together and call it, in this case, rest of Minnesota. Um, you can look at the metro area picture. You can look at a state level picture. You can play a movie uh, over the last so many days. Um, you can look at trends. You can see which states uh, things are going up or going down. And then uh, I'll mention a few more words about the other sources. So Facebook was gracious enough to allow us to put our uh, survey on their platform. As a result, we're getting about 150,000 survey answers every day. Um, and we're using them. Uh, so the surveys are actually, they are um, optional surveys. You can choose to, um, to, to um, answer it or not. Uh, we do encourage you to answer it even if you feel well. We explain that that's helpful as well. Of course, uh, we are aware that there's a selection bias there. We do uh, correct for that. Um, we have um, multiple questions there, but there are two that, that we found particularly helpful. One is, um, is there anybody in your household that have COVID-like symptoms? And we define what the symptoms are. We use that together with household information and demographic information to estimate prevalence in the population. And this is what you're seeing here. And then a different question that we ask is, um, do you know of anybody in your community uh, who has these symptoms? And the answer there is different and is not surprisingly uh, larger. Um, it's interesting to see you know, when they agree and when they don't. Uh, we also retuned our Google Health Trends. Uh, originally it was for flu, but we've uh, retrained it on, uh, on um, COVID-related searches. We had um, several other indicators here. One of them we had to suspend temporarily. The other one we had to retire. It had to do with uh, a measurement of flu testing. Turns out flu testing in um, February and March was a pretty good indicator of COVID activity because there were no COVID tests around and doctors were using flu tests to basically rule out flu. Uh, they don't do it anymore because flu is almost non-existent now. It's down to off-season levels, but we're going to uh, put in COVID testing uh, in the next uh, few weeks. Another uh, indicator that we added literally yesterday uh, is called Combined. It's a it's a non-supervised measure or a combined measure of, um, of all the other, I shouldn't say all the other indicators, so most of the other indicators. And uh, as a convenience, we also include um, case ratios and death ratios um, mirrored straight out of Johns Hopkins. We have a few more indicators in the pipeline. Um, a lot of it involves so procuring data and getting rights to publish it. All of this is put online, not only in the map, but also in an API. Um, so where's our API? So we have some explanation of the sources and of our methodology, and um, we have a uh, COVIDcast endpoint of our API. It's all on GitHub. Um, so there are many more sources in the through the API than on the map. And I will 
go back to the beautiful map and stop for questions. All right, uh, let's thank Ronnie for the eye-opening talk. Um, are there any questions?